Well, good morning and welcome to Matins on this Wednesday of the third week of Easter. Thank you for being with me today. Uh, the scriptures we will be using today are Psalm number 99. Uh, we're going to finish Exodus chapter 19, and we'll continue in uh, Colossians chapter 1. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? O everlasting God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, grant us your grace that we may study the Holy Scriptures diligently and with our whole heart seek and find Christ therein and through him obtain everlasting life through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. O oh, come, let us worship him. Alleluia. Okay. Psalm number 99. The Lord is king. Let the people tremble. He is enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all peoples. Let them confess his name, which is great and awesome. He is the Holy One. O mighty King, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and fall down before his footstool. He is the Holy One. Moses and Aaron are among his priests, and Samuel among those who call upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies and the decree that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them indeed. You were a God who forgave them, yet punished them for their evil deeds. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and worship him upon his holy hill. For the Lord our God is the Holy One. Let us pray. Lord our God, King of the universe, you love what is right. Lead us in your righteousness, that we may live to praise you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hmm. Our first reading is from Exodus chapter 19. We pick up where we left off yesterday with verse 16. We'll read to verse 25. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, 
lest they break through to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, Set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, Go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, so a little overlap with yesterday's reading. Remember, he, God has instructed Moses, I'm going to come and um, legitimize you, basically. I'm, go I'm giving you my word. I want you to proclaim this to the people, and I will appear, and here are some rules. I'm coming down on this mountain. Don't let anybody else come up. Um, we know that a sinful mortal being that close to God's glory would be killed because of his sinfulness. God's God's righteous glory can't um, can't stand that to be in its pre in His presence. So, so He gave them that they had to consecrate. He had to consecrate the people two days in a row, and they had to wash their clothes and be ready for the third day and make sure make sure you're ritually clean, which is what that means. So the morning of the third day, there's the thunder and lightning and thick cloud that God said would appear, right? And the trumpet blast was the signal, which is what God had given to them. And it struck fear into the hearts of all who were there, right? So Moses brought the people out and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain, which is where they were told. They were, at this point, they were still cooperating and behaving and obeying, excuse me. Hmm and obeying and wrapped in smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. That is the physical manifestation of the living God. Fire and smoke often signaled God's presence, especially in the context of covenant and promise. Interesting. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of, smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. Um, just to kind of give the reader an idea of how much smoke there actually was. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder, Moses spoke. God answered him in thunder. Yeah. So everything about God's appearance, his presence, his theophany, uh, the revelation of God, a God appearance, everything about this is um, awe-striking, right? Um, it would have driven the people to fear most certainly so the lord came down to the top of the mountain and he called moses to come up to him so he went up he was M moses is an obedient servant all right and now he tells them tells moses go down and warn them lest so that they don't try to break through the limits and try to to look which would kill them and let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves. All right. So even the priests who drew near to God in their duties were not exempt from this requirement. No one was to set foot on the mountain. And God repeating himself underscored the seriousness of the command, but it also helped commit the people commit their rules to memory. At this time, most people couldn't read, so it had to be done verbally. Okay, <clears throat> so he tells him that. Lest the Lord break out against him. And Moses said, you already warned us. People aren't going to come up here. This is what you told us, and we did it. So Moses is um, ignoring the fact that God is repeating for emphasis, I guess. Okay, then go down and bring Aaron back. Don't let the people come. Because if the people come, it will be deadly for them. So that's what he did. Aaron, remember, is Moses' mouthpiece. He helped share in the leadership responsibilities because Moses, as he told God, was not a good speaker. Some say that that meant that he had some kind of a speech impediment or there was something wrong with his voice. 
And he used that as an excuse to tell God, you, you got the wrong guy. I'm not your man. Moses said, I'll just tell you and your brother can be the spokesperson. And that's what ended up happening. So, all right. So this is going to be choppy for a couple of days until we get to the covenant, but we're going to, we're going to stop there and we'll pick up tomorrow with Moses receiving the 10 commandments. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, and that'll be a, a good refresher for all of us. All right, let's go back to Colossians, and we're going to read from verse 15 to verse 23. Um, and Paul is talking about Jesus Christ here. He, that is Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, so yesterday was just the opening uh, I, I'm thankful for you. I, I hear good things about you and your your ministries and your faith and your bearing fruit. And it's all coming from the teachings that you had. And don't forget those, right? <clears throat> and so he, he finishes yesterday's section talking about Christ, and how much they owe to him, right? That everything that God is blessing you with, including eternal light, is because of the Father who did all this for us in his Son. His Son is the reason we have been redeemed, the reason our sins are forgiven. So let's talk about this, this Son of God. He is the image of the invisible God. Now, um, no one has seen the Father. You could argue that Moses got to see part of his back, right? They put him in the cliff and put his hand in front of him and moved past him. And Moses got a glimpse of his back and that was it. Otherwise, he is invisible. We see him in uh, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. And we see him in um, the burning bush. We don't actually see God in his quote unquote true form, but... We remember that in Genesis, in the creation, God says, let us make man in our image. Every time you look on the face of another human being, you see the image of God. And Jesus taking on flesh is the image of God, right? Because he took on the same flesh we have. He is that image. He is the firstborn of all creation. Now, how can that be if everyone else that went before him, how can that possibly be? Well, oops, uh, it's Exodus. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So. I haven't even gotten out of the first verse yet. Sorry. So 
The other thing to remember is when when you say that word image, the definition of that is something that resembles the original in some way. So he is also, in that respect, the image of God. Um, I like this. They say here, Adam lost the image of God, but in Christ, who is the second Adam, God's image is restored. That'll preach. All right. All right. So in this case, firstborn doesn't mean the first in chronological order. What it means is the um, the first in stature, the first in um, a position of honor, right? The firstborn son. Um, this firstborn is not a part of the creation, but instead he is the cause of it. He is the firstborn means he is one who has great privilege in his father's house. Okay. By him, all things were made by means of, right? And we have this in John 1, 1 or, and following, right? In the beginning was the word and the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then it goes on to talk about how um, how God created everything uh, with his word, right? Christ is the word. By him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. You may not even be able to touch or see those things, but they're there. And they were created through him, and they were created for him. He is the the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. So he existed before the creation, again, John 1, 1, and holding all things together contradicts the teaching that creation is inherently evil. That is heresy. Creation is not inherently evil. Jesus still cares very much about the created world. He continues to sustain it, and he will renew the created world. If you read Revelation, we don't go to heaven. Heaven comes here, and heaven and earth are merged. Earth creation is redeemed. It is made whole. He is the head of the body, the church. Right? We are Christians. He is, it is him who directs our ways, who um, expresses his will for us, the church. He is the beginning and the, here we go again, the firstborn from the dead. So not just the firstborn of creation, but also the firstborn of the dead. And we know that because he is the first to die and be given a resurrected, glorified body. Now, others have been resuscitated. He is the first to be resurrected into his glorified body. And we don't entirely know what that means, but we we hear in Revelation that uh, there'll be no more pain, no more disease, no more no more death. So that body must be different to be impervious to those things. Um, so the cause of creation is also the cause of the resurrection. That in everything he might be preeminent. He is the first and the most important. Right? In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Okay? God is, Jesus is not half God, half man. Fully God and fully man, completely, right? The fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The totality of God with all his divine attributes began to dwell in Christ at the moment of his conception by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. He has been fully God from, the, from that moment. And he was before as well. All right. Now, 
And through him, God was pleased to reconcile himself to all things, all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Okay, that reconciliation happened because sin comes at a cost. The cost was paid in Jesus' blood. Because the cost is paid, that that distance between us and God has been fixed. Peace has been made between us and our creator. We are reconciled to him. Jesus' death makes peace possible by faith, but it is also his victory over all who continue to oppose him. All right. And you, the people Paul's writing this letter to, um, they were at one point alienated from God at one point, but they are now believers. You were hostile in mind. You didn't want to hear this stuff. You did evil things. He has now reconciled you in his body of flesh by his death. His death paid the price so that he can now present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him on judgment day, right? Remember, in his baptism, he take in our baptism, he has claimed us. He takes our sin to the cross, and he covers us with his righteousness. So when the judge looks at you, all they will see is Christ's right. All he will see is Christ's righteousness. If, if you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel you heard. Okay, you have to stay the path. You can't just keep on sinning, like Paul says in Romans 6. That's not the intent. Your sins can be forgiven when you repent and ask forgiveness. But that doesn't give you license to continue to sin. Well, I know I'm going to be forgiven, so I can just behave the way I want. The intent is that being a follower of Christ changes you. It changes you to make you more Christ-like that we would learn more about his will for us and follow it. And the gospel you heard is where you get your hope. And it has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Paul is now a minister of the gospel, whereas before he was a Pharisee. Now he's a minister of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. Right? Um, Jesus promised that the gospel would be proclaimed to all the world. And earlier, Paul said the gospel had come to all the world. That was back in verse 6. Um, these are figures of speech that show the universal scope of the gospel. This was in contrast to the message of the false teachers, that their secret knowledge was only for a select few. Paul is completely bound in his service to the gospel for the sake of the church. Right. Most of these letters, many of these letters that we read in the New Testament are addressing false teachers and their false teachings. This is part of it. The gospel is for everyone. It's not to be hidden. It's freely available. So, uh, again, that's a little bit of an abrupt stop, but that's where we're going to hold off until tomorrow. So let's conclude our liturgy. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. This is the day the Lord has made. Alleluia. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, 
The dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Alleluia. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Let us pray. Merciful Lord, hear the prayers of your people. May we who have received your gift of faith share forever in the new life of Christ. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have protected us through the night from all danger and harm. We ask you to preserve and keep us this day also from all sin and evil, that in all our thoughts, words, and deeds, we may please and serve you. Into your hands we commend our bodies and souls and all that is ours. Let your holy angels have charge of us, that the wicked one have no power over us. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. Mm. And that concludes our matins for this Wednesday. Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me. And thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Um, I think we're on track for um, keeping the schedule this week so far. So let's uh, be in prayer that it turns out that way. Um, so I'll be back with you tomorrow for matins. So I wish you a blessed rest of your third, your Wednesday, excuse me. And uh, I thank you for being here. And until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you. <laughs>